Mohammed Al Said. So I started my first clinic when I was 25. So I started trying to innovate the primary care unit to have more there for the people. That's what made my clinic so successful. Sweden for me is a chapter is ended. You know, you can have enemies like people, but when you have a government as an enemy, you feel very, very weak. This is one of the biggest fraud investigation in Swedish history. And then you were on the international Interpol. If you read about the laws of Sweden, they say this is the most best country to live in. Yeah. But freedom of speech, it's only good when it suits their agenda. Describe your life in one word. Very, very dramatic. <laughs> So without further ado, I'm Redin Jeromey. Wherever you are in your life or wherever you're going, whether financially, spiritually, or for your health, I hope you're on your way. Now let's get into it. Hamad Al Saeed. Nice meeting you. I'm glad uh, you made time for us to come on the podcast. Yeah, anytime. You know, when I met you first the other day and I heard your story, I knew that it was a story that typically I wanted people to hear, you know, a lot of the podcasts, they typically, you know, it's about what can you do for me? What, you know, what viewers do you have that will complement with me? It's more about the story. I want to showcase everyone's story um, to give them, you know, the platform to talk to people about what's happening so you can also better prepare people for what could happen. Right. And your story is a crazy one. Yeah. Your story is an <laughs> insane one. I think one day they'll make a movie out of your st uh, life. Maybe, I don't know. Honest. Maybe a book or something. A book? A movie, maybe. I don't know who wants to play me in the movie. I'll think about it. I'll tell you at the end of the podcast. <laughs> Let me think about it. So, I want to start off by... Let's start off at the beginning. So, you were born in Iraq. Yes. And South you of Iraq, Basra. Basra. Yeah. And you were born basically in the middle of a war zone. Yeah, more, more, 88, so I think the Iran-Iraq just, just finished or something. Yeah. But there was a, 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 a lot of political issues internally in Iraq, and my father was on the losing side, so mm. they needed to, to move from Iraq to Saudi, and yeah, we stayed there for three years in the desert. Wow. We were in this, like, I've seen it now in the, with the Syrian war, so it reminds me about it. They had like a small tents mm. where people were living. So almost like that for mm. three years, yeah. So you lived and so you lived in the middle of the desert for three years. Yeah. At what age? I was three years old back then, yeah. It was ninety one, so three years. So three, three to six. Three to six, yeah. And when I was talking to you the other day, you said to me your your childhood was probably so it was so traumatic that you didn't talk until you were six. Yeah, I don't, I think my brain just shut down this years because of the war. So I, I first of all, I don't remember so much and I did, couldn't speak. So I have younger siblings than me, they could speak, but I could, I could only say mama, I think. Mm. And then when I was six, I started speaking slowly. So I remember my younger brother and sister, they started school or nursery. I couldn't start because I couldn't talk. And my first memory actually is from the day we landed in Sweden. That's my first memory from China, so I was six then. Anything before that, I don't, I don't really remember it. Mm. I've ha had pictures, like they had pictures of it, so when I see it, it's, I think I make up my own memory of it. But I don't remember so much. My other siblings, I remember most, most of the time. Are they older than you? I have <coughs> two older brothers, one older sister, and the rest are younger than me, so four younger sisters and one younger brother. So I'm in the middle. You're in the middle. So you don't remember anything about the war, Iraq, your brain just shut it yeah, off. Yeah, they just shut it off. It's crazy that the brain can do that. They can put the bad memories in the back of the memory, uh, in the back of the brain, so you don't yeah. think about it. But I think my brain is doing that with every bad situation that's happening to me in my life. Mm. And it's, it's a kind of defense mechanism, I think. Of course. To just shut it down so I can focus on my goal that I want to reach. Yeah. And then what happens? So at the age of six, I want you to continue your story. Okay, yeah. So after age of six, we came to Sweden. So the UN, UN, um, uh, some UN countries come and picked up some families from, from uh, the desert of Saudi Arabia. And one of these countries was Sweden. And my father picked Sweden and we came 
I think 93 or 94, I don't really remember, but I remember it was the World Cup, uh, summer of 94, yeah, summer of 94. And after that, we lived in a, a poor area of, of, of Stockholm. My father was, was driving, he started learning Swedish and all of that, and he started working as a cab driver. I remember he was working like 16 hours a day or something like that, because mm. we were nine children in total, so. He had to take care of us and his family back in Iraq, his father and other brothers and sisters. I didn't see so much of my father because he was busy making money and my mom was taking care of us. The only time we saw him is when we made problems and I made a lot of problems when I was young, fighting in schools and, and or in school or in the street with the other neighboring kids. Um, but uh, I was very good in school, so I was, it was easy for me to learn mathematics or physics. Or, but languages was not my st strongest, strongest part. And I was very good in uh, football. But when I became 18, my father told me to start studying med school because I had good grades. So I started med school and stopped football. Um, six years med school, and then I had. Uh, two years internship, but before I finished med school, or when I finished med school, I started my my first business, and it was a clinic. So in, back in Sweden, we don't have insurances, so we work direct, the government pays for all of that. So if you wanna open a private family medicine practice as a primary care unit, you need to make a contract with the municipality of, of back then, or now it's Stockholm. So I started my first clinic when I was 25 or 24, something like that. And I started employing my mentors from the hospitals as, as, as doctors in, in, the, in the clinic. Um, <coughs> so, so, so far your life has been a success story. You've come from war, very traumatic childhood, living in a tent in Saudi Arabia in the desert for three years, and then got, moving to Sweden, your dad working as a taxi driver really hard, and then you didn't see much of your dad. You, he just kept working to support nine kids. And then you got good grades, so you went to the uh, university and you became a doctor. And then you started employing your friends. So, in, so far, it's a success story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? And this, then what? Okay, so, yeah, but the thing is, is, back in Sweden, it's very segregated from, like, the native Swedish people from the refugees like us. Mm -hmm. And the primary care units in these areas are just really, really bad. Mm -hmm. So I, my goal and vision was to build something very innovative with, because you get disappointed. You, you, you grow up with Transformers and you know, movies like that. And then when you, when you become 25, there is nothing like that. There is no robots, there is no. So I starting trying to innovate the healthcare, especially the primary care unit to have uh, more online and more to be more more there for the people. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's what made my clinic so successful. So first of all, we had open to 10 p.m. In Sweden, 4 p.m. they close. And the weekends we were also open to 10 p.m. So people started coming to my clinics instead of the, my competitors. And I wanted to be the largest chain in, in Stockholm. And that's when my problems start happening. So I was alone in these clinics. I had a lot of help from my brothers, of course, but you're alone, you have the, you don't know so much about the tax system and all of that. So you needed to learn that the hard way, you made a lot of stupid mistake, costly mistake, but all of a sudden I start feeling that the municipality or the politic people sitting in the municipality starting having eyes on me more. And I was wondering why I'm doing a good job here. I'm, and also I'm doing a good job for the population of Stockholm. Um, so you caught the attention of the government? Yeah, most. that's when my problem started. It's back in 2017. Um, and I was making good money, but I was working 14, 15 hours a day. So I didn't really have time to think about it because I wanted to have 50 primary care units. So, and I know it's a long way to go there. But if you became, become so big, alone, my name is a Muslim name, I look like I'm an Arab, I feel Swedish, but I look like an Arab, it doesn't sound good. In the, and I made the government look bad because they had big issues in the primary care units with the population there. If you want to meet a family medicine doctor, you need to wait for three, four weeks, sometimes six weeks 
for me, for, with me it was maximum three four days and you have a time or you can come just and drop in mm. so i find my niche and i find a way to be more available to the to the people that didn't make the government look so so good because here comes a 25 years old guy and he solved all the problem that the politic guys are promising the population that, that they're gonna fix um, I didn't care so much about it back then because I believed in the system that nobody can hurt me as long as I'm doing what I, what I, what I need to do, pay my taxes and have a, a, a good business. But all of a sudden I start having problem with the tax authorities, everything went fine there and then the government all of a sudden decided to revoke all my licenses for the, for the clinics. So that was my first back set. I was 30 years old then. But during that time, I started doing, uh, I bought the PCR machines and I was starting doing PCR tests for people who wants to travel. Mm -hmm. um, and there we become one of Sweden's biggest um, uh, PCR testing for travel certificate. And did that make them more angry? That made them even more angry. You know when you, take a fish out from water yeah. and it start you think it's dead but it's presley so you need to kill it off so that i was almost they thought i was dead when they took off my license then when they see i'm still making money and i'm good in the business they thought let's shut this guy down completely because sure. i had partners in that too but i never felt that they were so much attacked as as me sure and that's when i start to understand i need to leave this country where was your partners from? Uh, one was from Serbia. Okay. And one was from Turkey, I think. Okay. But also born and raised in Sweden. And, <coughs> okay. Uh, but they wasn't so successful as, as I was with my other businesses. Mm -hmm. So they were my partners only in the PCRs. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> with the PCRs, the big thing about that was it was so much writing about this PCR testing and a lot of people was making money. Um, and I, I had the like Emirates Airlines was one of my clients, Turkish Airlines. And we could, we also there made the government look bad because with my own PCR machines, I could give result within eight hours, nine hours, and with the half of price. With the government, they couldn't give you within, they give you within 72 hours, and you pay double the price. So all, that also piss, pissed them off, what I think. Uh, either way, it's 2020, I think, in June, I was going home and all of a sudden you see all the newspaper, my picture is out, my name is out. So that's also against the law of Sweden that you put somebody out in the newspaper like that. Because they have to be convicted guilty first. Yeah, exactly. You need to do that first and then, but they put that and they didn't put any other names. There were 20 people accused of the organization, none of their names until today, uh, like in the, in the news, nobody's writing anything about them. And that's when I understood I, I need to go. And one of the police uh, officers that was working on this case, he was one of my patients, so in, in one of the clinics. So he called me and said, listen, you need to leave. The, the prosecutor is coming after you, she's been after you for a while. Now she'll have a good chance, just leave. Don't come in, don't speak with us. They put you in custody and I don't know how long you will be in custody. In Sweden, you don't have any law that decide how long you can be in custody as long as the investigation is ongoing. Mm. So you can be there for three years mm. with full restriction, no TV, no, you cannot, nobody can visit you, nothing. Wow. So that's, that's what... Can you see your lawyers? You can see your lawyer like one time a week or one time every wow. second week, but the lawyers there are paid by the government. So you cannot have a private lawyer that you pay him by yourself. Okay. So when this happened, a lot of the big star lawyers was, was calling me and wanted the case because it was big news. I think it was international news even. It was all over the news. And for me, it was, it was a shock. I didn't really believe that it was so serious. So I wanted to go until this officer called me. Mm -hmm. And then I left back home to Iraq because my father moved back to Iraq in 2018, 19, something like that. I went to him and then after that I came to Dubai. So and then when I came to Dubai I started from zero again. 
<clears throat> so, when you started doing the PCR testing, they then they really came hard on you. Yeah. And then they went on the news and they started giving you a bad name. Yeah. Right? And they froze all your assets? All assets was frozen within seconds. So, most of my money that I made from my other business that I paid tax for, all of them is frozen. My houses, my cars, everything was frozen. Mm. And the funny thing with all of this is the money that uh, they say was illegal, the PCR money, they released those money. <laughs> so my partners took that, took that money. And all the other money that they say was illegally done, all of that is, is released. Mm -hmm. So... <clears throat> This was the more, the, if you dig deep in this case with the PCR, you will see many funny things. And my lawyers in Sweden are asking her, even the police was sending on Instagram to all the people, putting posts on Instagram, have you been, uh, have the fake test of PCR through this oh. company, please call us. And they have nobody's call. I, I, even I got an email from the police, have you been in, and my email is hamad.alsay that you cannot go wrong. It's yeah. you're searching for me and you're sending me an email if I'm. Yeah. So the whole thing was very bad. But this is the biggest, one of the biggest fraud investigation in Swedish history. Yeah. It's a very, very big. I remember they were talking about 40 officers into this investigate, lead investigator officer yeah. in this. And I'm very surprised that they, with all of this money they put in into this investigation, that they haven't gone to trial. Mm. If you have your proof, go to trial. You can judge me without me being there. Mm. If there is so much proof, what like they portray it in the newspapers. And I spoke once with the prosecutor and I told her, why is my name in the newspaper? She said, but it's not us, the media is there, but somebody is leaking information to them. And she was, but obviously it's from them. They, this, they do this psychologically, so they destroy you first psychologically. If you don't come in, they try to seize all of your money. If you still doesn't come in, they go after your kids. And after that, you either give up or you come into them. And they can put you two years in custody, you lose everything, and then they say, sorry, sorry. Nobody will even write about that in the news. And it's not only with me, there is a lot of stories like this in, in Sweden. It's a small country, but there is a lot of, when people, it doesn't need to be that you're a Muslim or you're from, look like an Arab. You can be a Swedish guy, but you come from, you don't have the power with the political people and you get successful, they destroy you. Mm -hmm. They'll do everything to, to take this power from you. Mm -hmm. And I really, really didn't want to believe that even when this happened to me, I don't know what, because I feel like a Swedish man. All my discipline, all my mentality have been, all good that I've got is from Sweden. Mm -hmm. It's not from my home country like Iraq. Iraq didn't provide anything for me. I could become a doctor in, back in Sweden, so, so I really didn't want to believe that. But the more this was going on, you could see how much corruption it is. Mm. And especially in big cities like Stockholm. Mm -hmm. And even now, like, we had the COP28 now. In, in, yeah. If you read the Swedish papers, they are only talking bad about the leadership of, of UAE. Wow. That's the only, only thing that they do. Okay. When Expo 2020 was here in, in UAE, yeah. same. So, and then you were on the international Interpol. Yeah, and then that's after one year. So after one year, I think, when Swedish television was here, they made an interview with me. And I told them I'm here, I'm not hiding, she can call me. I can go to the Swedish embassy and talk with her if, she's, if that's what the all the investigation is waiting for and I don't have any issues to talk with her. And then after two, three days I was on, on Interpol and they on the red notice then. But the, also this is, for me it was a shock. Because they put terrorists on the Interpol. You put, they put murderers and they put uh, people who rape and big drug dealers and you know, in Sweden, I don't know if you read about it, Stockholm is one of the most dangerous cities in Europe right now because they blow up buildings, they kill people, they kill everybody. Like It's, it's like a war zone mm -hmm. and they don't have any control over it, the Swedish police. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking you're leaving all of that and you're coming after me because you think something or I didn't go by your playbook or you couldn't control me. I was getting big into healthcare. Just say what, how it is to the people. And you know, even I knew, even if I go back now to Sweden, I will be free, but they destroyed my name. 
whatever I built over this eight, nine years, it's destroyed. You can, I cannot build that back again. Right. Nobody wants to conduct any business with me because they portray me as a fraud guy, mm -hmm. as a guy who wants to cheat people in the most sensitive time of the world with the corona. And even that is a separate discussion, how the corona virus was conducted out in the media and how they scared people with the COVID and the lockdowns and, and, and etc. So yeah. So you were on the Interpol, which is crazy because you're a doctor yeah. with clinics that you help people. You're, you know, you're on the biggest morning show of Sweden. You know, something like Morning America or yeah, yeah, something yeah. like the, the like on that. I was on a lot of those shows, even a lot of big conference. I was talking because I was very innovative in back in 2015. I was taking about artificial intelligence into into healthcare and, and stuff like that, that people are talking about now. Yeah, I was talking about this eight years ago and yeah. I was doing and building this kind of software. Yeah, there's videos of it. Yes, yeah, so a, a lot yeah. of it, a lot of it. So you, you were on the biggest shows, the biggest morning TV shows, showcasing your newest technology, really pushing the innovative boundaries of healthcare. Yeah. And then they put you on international Interpol. Now, does Dubai not have an international treaty with Sweden, with Sweden where they couldn't like take you back to Sweden if they asked for it? I don't think they have like any extradition contract, sure. but and Dubai need to do their own assessment if they want to leave me or not, and they need to ask me if I don't want to go back or not. And on top of that, I'm an Iraqi citizen, so I have my rights from my Iraqi um, roots, let's say. Yeah. They need to talk with the Iraqi. I'm, I'm not scared of like getting caught or because I, I don't have anything to hide. Yeah. I just don't want to go back to the Swedish system, court mm. system. They can judge me here in Dubai. I don't mind to have the whole court here in Dubai mm -hmm. uh, or UAE. Let them do the, but the problem is with the Swedish government, and I've seen some other cases here with Swedish people that didn't want to go back home, is that Swedish government doesn't believe in the court system of, of UAE because they say this is a dictatorship. So we don't believe in their uh, jurisdiction. Mm. So this is also an issue. If I don't want to go back to Sweden and I tell them I want my court to be here in UAE, they will not send any files. And a funny, more funny thing, I've been trying to make Interpol to send me my files and my files are empty so they put me on Interpol without any there is nothing that's just government telling Interpol put him on but where is my file where is my case I want to read what's in my files but they know this is can be official if I take this and go out in media and it will be another scandal but I really think that I saved their face when I left because with all of this newspaper and all of this talking and you then you release 20 accused people they put them in custody for six months and then you just release them and you release all of the money that you say it's illegal it doesn't look good so what it's the case is very they write a lot of about it in the newspapers and another thing is that when they write about it they write about how much money i made on this and in sweden is a sweden is a gangster paradise they know the gangster knows this guy have this much money they go on your family they, they try to get your money and I'm 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 raised up in these neighborhoods so also the Swedish government put another and when when, when we call the police and tell them we need to protect us so we can't do anything so that's also an issue with the Swedish government that how they treat this kind of stuff but the whole system is breaking down back in back in Sweden it's it's uh, I'm happy I'm not living there anymore mm. and I'm happy I could see this th that this happened to me so it waked me up from the all false hope that they give you mm -hmm. from your s small child till you grow up because it's not fair to live there you, you're not on the same level as Johan Son or Svensson you're not on the same level they say it it looks good in the but it's not you're not on the same level and I wish I knew it then I know I need to work maybe a hundred times more mm -hmm. to be on the same level as them so, and now it's a very right-wing controlling and they're openly racist now in, in the parliament of Sweden against Islam or Muslims. And I don't know if you read about they have the burning of the Quran, taking the children of the Muslim from Muslim family homes and put them with the other. It's a lot of this stuff happening and so I'm, I'm, I'm very happy I don't live there anymore.
If you like this video, consider subscribing. We do weekly podcasts with experts in every industry to help you find direction and guide you on your way. Now let's get back into it. So did you experience racism when you lived there? When yeah, you grew of up course, there? Of course, of course. Racism is everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the thi- now, what, what's, what's different now from then, before they can give you a look or they don't really say it, now they say it openly. So now you can hear it directly. They're not like, before it was hush hush, we are a open society, everybody is worth the same. Now it's like, yeah. your place is to drive the bus mm. and your place is to run the restaurant. Mm. You're not allowed to be a successful entrepreneurship to control the healthcare here in, here in, in Stockholm. Wow. This is very now on, on the agenda. They, wow. They, they, but I hope that people in Sweden, if they see this, that they start thinking about this. And I can see here a lot of people are moving from Europe, spe- specifically Sweden. They're tired of, of, of living there because the, the government is not run well. Mm. It's, it's a, small, uh, a small revenge for me, but... And I hope that... Sweden get back to where it was in the 90s when we came there and they really gave people a chance to build themselves up. Now it's not like that anymore. Mm. Sounds like Nazi Germany 1945. It's not, maybe I over exaggerated because I'm very emotional about it because I see Sweden as my home and I don't like that the way that it's run right now. Yeah. But it's it's really it's a big mess right now. There, mm. you, if you read the newspapers in, in back home in Stockholm, what's happening there? It's it's a big mess. Mm. It's shootings every day. People are killed. Buildings are getting. Uh, it's like Gaza, yeah. second second Gaza. But not on the news. Not on the news now. But there's also another thing that there is families in in Sweden that control the whole thing. Some some of the f- very wealthy families they control 30 percent of the GDP of Sweden. Wow. So it's a lot of this kind of stuff. You didn't really know about it if you're a, like a regular citizen and you're not competing with them. Yeah. So you start learning this when you go into business and getting big. Sure. And, and uh, yeah. So, so with your assets that has been frozen, are you allowed to say how much? Yeah, but I prefer not. Weird yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you see that in your account and you can't touch it? Or no, you're completely blocked? I'm, no, I'm completely blocked. Okay. So when this happened, I get like 20 from all my banks that you are because of the money laundering law, ter- anti-terrorism law, this you know, blah, 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 your, your account is shut down. Mm. I cannot do anything about sure. it. And then I get a big letter from the prosecution, prosecutor office that all your assets are seized. You cannot do anything with them and that's it. And are you still on international Interpol? Yeah, yeah, I'm still. You're still I'm on still, Interpol. Yeah, three years now. So you can't travel. You can't. No, do I can't do anything. But I'm in the best place in the world, so I'm not. Best place yeah, in the world. So I'm very happy to be here because I'm I'm an Arab and I'm. This country makes me very proud to, because they give chances and equal chances to everybody. Yeah. The leadership is very clear on how they want who wanted to be here. So I'm I'm happy and I I, I wish I could live here the rest of my life. Yeah. I love it here. It's the thank God you're in the best place in the world. Yeah. You know, I, I I'm you know going to every ten days or something I go on holiday, but I only go for three days. Yeah. Because I need to come back to this city. Yeah, I can't stay away. If you can't, if you get used to this, yeah, you cannot leave. leave I can't it. stay. No. I can't stay away. I really can't. So thank God you're Alhamdulillah. You're in the best city in the world that you every day feels like a holiday here. Yeah, exactly, and yeah. Uh, it's safe. It's everybody have equal rights to do however they want. Yeah. And it gave me a chance to, to bounce back. Yeah. And we, if I was another country, I don't think I will bounce back so good as, as, as here. Mm. What's next for you with, when it comes to Sweden? Are, are you going to court? No, Sweden for me, I, I told this to the Swedish uh, um, television when they were here. It's, Sweden for me is a, is a chapter is ended. The money they have frozen, they can take them. Maybe they need them more than I need. The economy, economy is shit there. So they can take them, give it to whatever they want to give. I don't care about I don't care about my houses. I don't care about it, nothing. If I'm going to be stuck on waiting for the money to be released. You know, I, I, I told my father this when this happened because he asked me how I feel. I tell him, it was me who made the money. The money didn't make me. So whatever I am, I'm going to make new money. And if you have this mindset, 
it's and you've done you already know how to make money one time it's easy for you to make it again it was it haven't been easy two years but it, it, we I bounced back again mm -hmm. because you know for me this 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 comeback is not it's not a normal comeback for me this comeback is very very personal mm -hmm. because I see you know you can have enemies like people but when you have a government as an enemy you feel very very weak you feel that you cannot do anything yeah and you see it every day you know eight months in the newspaper every day you go read about this and you bring shame about your family you bring shame about you know you know the surname of your family and nobody your sisters or your brothers nobody like really like to be associated with that and before i was the hero of the family and now all of a sudden you're the you bring us shame mm. So this was also a very difficult moment. Like, I don't care about what people say, but when it's close, family and friends, then you start thinking about it all yeah. the time. And you go in every day and they need to, and you get these messages, you know, from, I remember how my mom doesn't speak Swedish or reads Swedish. So they, she got to know this from WhatsApp groups that Iraqi communities was, they were translating this newspaper and sending this in Arabic. They were like, happy that this guy is gone now so a lot of jealous people they were they were very happy that this happened because it's finished me in sweden mm. but for me coming here and have a chance really a good chance and to bounce back again i'm i'm very happy for that choice why do you think the reason was they came after you what do you think the reason is i think you know i was very naive and when you work alone and your own owner of uh, like the chain I had and I starting applying for more chain for like making it bigger they didn't really like that this guy is gonna have some some power into this so they start searching for reasons to shut me down and this is what I think was the start of it and I was very controversial when I went out now I'm very political when I'm speaking usually I go I went rant on the politic movement and the one people who was in charge of the municipalities in, 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 in Stockholm because they, the, the, the healthcare in, 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 in Stockholm especially, it's not good and it's still not good. Mm -hmm. And with all of the tax that we pay, mm -hmm. you think it will be spot on, but it's still, it's still very, very, very bad. Mm -hmm. So when I went out and they invite me to talk about innovation and, and, and stuff like that, and I was always asking the question, why is the government not doing it? They have the money. Why are why are we so far behind? Um, so this is also a thing that uh, one of the timers went out and said that all of them are gangsters. They're worse than the mafia. So I was very controversial when speaking. Mm. I was very very naive because I was thinking you can say anything you want without mm. you know. So if I have one regret, I should have been more politic and more closer to them and. So I think this is this what I think, but maybe it's something, some other reasons. But I've seen it now many times with other guys that become very successful in other countries and very influential and people start listening to them. And the agenda of what they're saying is not the same as the, what the government wanted mm. to be. They try to shut them down, they try to put them in jail, they start writing bad stuff about them to destroy them. Because it's not, I think when, when you start, whatever you say, start influencing people and it's not in the same agenda that they, that they want, that's when they start wanting to shut you down. It's not about you have a big amount of followers, it's just about what you're saying and what you are telling these people and that listen to you, they're going in a different direction from what the governments want. That's what I think it's... Uh, was my, one of the main reasons because I was very influential in this neighboring areas whatever I said in, in within healthcare and it, it resonated with mm. these people so I think that's also one of the main reasons but you wouldn't have known that because Sweden I would assume is a third is, is a first world country yeah of course. like Australia like yeah. UK like America you can speak bad about the government you know that's what the beauty of free speech is yeah but it seems like Sweden portrays themselves as a first world country. Yeah, of course. If you read about the laws of Sweden, they say this is the most best country to live in. Mm. But freedom of speech, it's only good when it suits their agenda. You cannot go to Sweden and say, I love Putin. 
Do you lose your job directly? Wow. If you cannot go to Sweden and say, I don't like homosexuality, I'm against it. But you, if you say, ah, why does this Muslim make Ramadan? They're stupid. They say it's freedom of speech. Hmm. The second largest political party, Sverige Demokraterna, they call, he went out just two weeks ago and said, I want to destroy all the mosques in Sweden. Wow. And they say, but this is freedom of speech. This is a political part. We cannot do it. But if, you, if I go out and say, ah, uh, I support Palestine and whatever Israel is doing is wrong. They're terrorists. They say, this is not freedom of speech. This is anti semitism Take him in. Hmm. So this is the problem. This is the double standards. And people are try starting to see through that. Hmm. I don't really care if, 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 because I'm, I'm for freedom of speech, but let me speak freely then. Mm. I've, I've said no to a lot of journalists, they trying to make interviews like, but I say no to them because they will cut it and do it in the way they like mm. to suit their agenda. I, I cannot sit like this and talk freely like this. Mm. So this is the double standard of, I think most of European countries, this is not only, I think the Western world, mm. they're declining a lot and they're trying to, social media have changed it's it's giving people a voice to talk and and show the 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 double standards of those countries sweden is a puppet to the us at the end of the day so they will do whatever the us is telling them they don't have any uh, freedom exactly. mm. so i don't blame them they're a small country mm. but don't tell us we can say whatever we want yeah. because we really doesn't you cannot raise your children in a normal you're a girl and you're a boy now in the nurseries, if you have a child going in the Swedish nursery, you're not allowed to teach them her and him. They have like a binary something mm. bullshit, blah, blah, blah. But if I have a girl, I want it to be, I want it to be a girl. Mm. If you say something else to your daughter at home, they take her from you. Yeah, of course, exactly. So this is also exactly. a double standard. Exactly. If I'm a parent, I want to raise my children however I want. Don't push your stupid agenda into my, my, my children. And this is why most of the people is leaving these countries right now to come to dictator countries like they say in, in, in Western media about those countries. Yeah. At least here I can raise my children however I want. Mm. It's not possible in Sweden. Oh. But if you read <laughs> Swedish newspapers, UAE is a dictatorship and they are the biggest, wow. uh, it's a big jealousy. Yeah, of course. It's, and it has to do with uh, they are Muslims and they are Arabs. Mm. They really don't like that. Whatever they're gonna say, if you read the, 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 the agendas of them, this is what it's boiled down to. There is no other reason why do, you don't like UAE or other Arabic countries. And then now we have big example in what's happening in the conflicts of, of the Middle East. So when Arabic Muslim or, or even Christian Arabs dies, it's normal. But when other type of people dies, it's a big thing. And this double standard is showing more and more to the people. Of course. <clears throat> it's like if somebody goes out and kills five men on the streets, it won't be big news. Yeah, but yeah. if somebody goes out on the streets and kills five women... Yeah, like the killings news. in Australia, I remember, a yeah. couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah, Corona, uh, the Cornell riots. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He was uh, just mentally ill, but if he was a Muslim, he will be a terrorist. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you're referring to. You know, with with, the, with what you said about the non-binary, I have no problem with anybody. If you were born and you knew you, you were supposed to be born a man, but you were born a woman, no worries. Do whatever you like. Call yourself a man. Cut your hair. Do, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the hormonal therapy, yeah. whatever. But leave the children alone. Yeah. Because if you tell a four-year-old, are you a boy or a girl? And he says, I'm a boy. Girls have cooties. Are you mm. sure you're a girl? Yeah, I'm sure I'm a girl. I'm sure I'm a boy. No, are you sure you're not a girl? No, I'm not a girl. If you keep asking that boy, are you a girl? He's going true. to go home thinking, maybe I'm a girl. Yeah, true. You know? But this is the main issue with this. I, I'm, I'm the same. I don't care what you want to be. Yeah. But don't, don't shove it down in our children. Yeah, exactly. Leave the children alone out of this. Yeah. So I totally agree, yeah. If you were to describe your life in one word, what word would it be? So far, because your life is still going. You're still very young. Yeah, I'm 35 only. Yeah. You're 35. You're still yeah, yeah. very young. So your story is at the beginning still, but so far, what if you were to exp uh, describe your life in one word? One well, word is difficult, but I think dramatic. Dramatic. Very, very dramatic. <laughs> I think I've been through most of like from West, like being me raised up in a first country, world yeah. country like you call Sweden, 
to go through this kind of stuff I've been through, it's very, very dramatic. Yeah. Because you usually have a nice life in this country, it's easy, especially if you work in healthcare and you're a doctor and you accomplish already a lot. So, and I, I don't remember so much of my youth because it's been so dramatic. Mm. You finish high school, go to med school directly, start working before ending med school, you start the first clinic because I had a goal. I wanted to make big innovations and I want to retire when I was 30, 31, mm -hmm. so I can invest all of the money I made into innovation that can change the healthcare. Mm. Because healthcare is a very, very old fashioned business yeah. and it frustrates a lot of people. If you go to a, to a healthcare system and you're not sick, you're going to get sick just of the system. The doctors are like dinosaurs, with all due respect to all my doctor colleagues. Some of the doctors are still writing prescription on paper and pen. Nobody is interacting with the, mm. with the patients as they... You know, I always say to, the, to my colleagues, is, you are, or my employees, my doctors, but you're just an advisor. Mm. With all the information that is out right now, you can only advise your, 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 your patient. You cannot force him into something because he will go and he will find the information that you spent six years or learning out there on the internet. Exactly. So you need to advise him to the best decision. Mm. And only of this small stuff with technology, we can change that. And this was, that's why I say, if I want to change one word, is very dramatic. Dramatic. And on top of that, I have, I've already, I made, the, I have a, like I have a wife and two kids, so on top of all of that, I have a, another family to take care of, and I put them in a not so nice position with all my drama in my life. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, dramatic. You can dramatic. say easily dramatic. Let's talk about the future. You've got a clinic in Dubai, all right? What are you working on in Dubai? Do you want to talk about that? Okay, so I have different projects in Dubai. We have the clinics with the. Um, uh, but mostly it's softwares and innovations and I see Dubai as the perfect platform so we work a lot of with primary care AI doctors that you can treat people online through AI through 37 d uh, the conditions mm -hmm. so most of them can be treated by an AI doctor so you as a customer will think that you speak with a normal doctor but it's an AI so this AI can treat a hundred thousand patients at once and you have one doctor that just check that the AI is doing the right job. Wow. So yeah, we're working on type like that. We're giving also real-time information and, and prognostics into your future health. So with the data we collect from, from each individual, we can give him a five-year assessment of if he will have a stroke, if he will have a diabetes or a metabolic syndrome, and how he can change that. And in real time, giving him feedback on his change if it's working or not. So, and I'm also building another, we're building also digital twins of, of it on the metaverse. So primary care units on, on metaverse that you as an individual, you can have a digital twin that have all of your health data and you can also get treated in, uh, as a, in virtual reality. Uh, this one is longer on the line. I think we'll finish it in eight months, but we're working a lot of it. All the algorithms that we are working on, it's made by me. So I'm following the WHO standards for some of these 37 conditions. So it's, this is my largest project and this is where all my passion goes to. Um, what does that mean that your virtual twin gets operated on? So <clears throat> in the metaverse world, if, so for people who doesn't know that is like a virtual world, you can have yourself in, into there so we call that a digital twin and the digital twin you can whatever data you collect here and you give to the software your digital twin will have it so when you go with the VR Googles to the metaverse clinic and the doctor that sit on the other side with his VR he can see you he can really see you as you are and when you measure yourself with with the with the, with the medical devices that you have at home the doctor will see whatever you're giving him in real time. Wow. So you never really need to go to the... Doctor anymore. To doctor anymore. But this is possible, you know, with 37 conditions or 40 conditions. But then when you have complicated um, conditions, that's when you really need to go see a doctor. Because most of the cases now, when you go to the clinics and you go to the hospital, most of this condition can be treated from home. 
mm. a lot of chronic conditions uh, or metabolic disease condition like diabetes or, 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 or hypertension can treat, be treated from home. Mm -hmm. You don't really need to go back and forth. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to, the most common condition to treat them online through apps or through the, the metaverse uh, mm -hmm. technologies. Wow, that's mind blowing. And I think the doctor on the other side can also say to you, hey, uh, it's a bit suspicious, come in. Yeah, of course. Right? So, and the, the AI will give the doctor a heads up before the damage is done. Because mm -hmm. most of the diseases are, are, are treated now when the damage is already done. Mm -hmm. You can have diabetes for four or five years without you s seeing the symptoms. But when you see the sim symptoms, it's when you already are damaging your organs. Sure. So with the AI and, and with real time, uh, real time monitoring, you can uh, predict that and prevent it. Sure. Like we always, they, when we go to med school, they always teach us the best medicine is the uh, preventive medicine. Yeah. But when you go out to work as a doctor, your practice is completely opposite than that. Yeah. You're making money on people who are sick because you need to prescribe the medicine. Mm. In most of the countries, the, the doctor get a commission back from each medicine he... Mm. And this goes completely against the doctor norm. Mm -hmm. So most of the doctors get co commission for each medicine they prescribe. But our main job is to prescribe as little as possible. Mm -hmm. So you, you need to work with the preventive side of it. So you keep your patient healthy. But if you're making more money on keeping your patient sick, that's when the it will go against the, how do you say, the morals of a doctor. Sure. So if you go to a lot of emergencies here, and anywhere in the world that have insurance, the doctor have a sale cap. He needs to reach it. He's like a salesman. Of course. So he forgot his what what's best for the for of the course. for the patient. Not all of the doctors, of course. No, I, I will not. But if you need to make a hundred k to survive your family, you will start mm, prescribing stuff exactly. that your customers doesn't really need. Exactly. So yeah. this is also dangerous. So with the technology, so you can prevent that and companies can still make money it's nothing yeah. wrong with making money on healthcare it's just you need to do it in in a better way and healthcare is one of this um, one one of the one of the biggest sectors that is way behind the technologies maybe not very super specialist they very good in robotics and surgeries and stuff there we very high advanced but in the normal condition day to day problems that most of the people have it's still a struggle yeah yeah, I understand. So I'm trying to change that, that part. Yeah, and I'm glad because there's so many, look at the opioid crisis. Yeah. So many people, you can't sleep pills. Yeah. You know, instead of saying, go to the sauna, 20 minutes before sleep, go to the sauna. Yeah. Be in the sauna and then that, that'll put you to sleep. Yeah. Right? This is also one of the best things in UAE. They're very controlled on these drugs. Yes. So not any doctor can prescribe yeah. them and it needs to get an approval from the government before prescribe. So this is one of the, that's why you don't see this. Yeah. Misuse here in, misuse, U, in, yeah. in UAE. Yeah. Well, Doctor, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Thank you. I appreciate you telling your story. Nice to be here. If Absolutely. you want to do a second episode yeah. for the second movie, just let me know. <laughs> we'll you, never, you never know what will happen in the next 10 years. <laughs> in your life, yeah. yeah. Especially in your life. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. I appreciate yes. you. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.